York University, but for nine years I was the archivist for the Toronto Harbor Commission, which uh, was responsible for reclaiming the property on which we're now standing. Ninety years ago, if we were standing here, we'd be quite wet, even wetter than what we are this afternoon. It was at that time a 1,300-acre marshland, it was the largest wetlands in eastern Canada. And there was quite a wide variety of uh, birds and fish in the area. There are reports from the late 19th century of uh, people catching pike in Ashbridge's Bay. Um, and there were also residential communities along the North Shore. So if you go to those areas around Morse, Carla, and Logan, uh, there was a large neighborhood there that fronted onto Ashbridge's Bay. As well as you head, if you head down to Cherry Beach, you'd be on the property that was originally Fisherman's Island. It was a, uh, an area settled by commercial fishermen in the 1880s, uh, about I think 20 families or so that lived down there and they actually had their own church, St. Nicholas's Church, which was a, a mission church of St. James Cathedral, and uh, they stayed there until 1917. Now, the trouble with the marsh from the point of view of people who operated the port along the north shore of the harbor was that large chunks would break off quite often, float into the harbor, and disrupt commercial. That, of course, led to the outbreak of typhoid and a very uh, marked deterioration of, uh, of of the water quality in Ashbridge's Bay, which fed into a number of discussions that were going on in the 1880s and 1890s and plans to reclaim Ashbridge's Bay for industrial purposes. And so by I guess by uh, 1889, we have Beavis and Brown come forward with the first plan for the reclamation of Ashbridge's Bay, and then by the 1890s, the Grand Trunk Railway had its own design. Plan through to the Inner Harbor, and that's where we wind up with Keating's Channel. At the same time, in the early 1890s, they built the Coatsworth Cut, which was a, a, uh, a channel dredged through the southeast corner of Ashbridge's Bay. There's a remnant of it left now as you drive along Unwin Avenue, but it, the purpose was to flush all the sewage from Ashbridge's Bay into the Inner Harbor, where most of the city's sewage was being deposited anyway. Industrial and commercial expansion at the time, as by concern over public health. In 1912, the Harbor Commission released its waterfront plan. It was a very broad scheme covering the waterfront from the Humber River all the way to the eastern beaches. In this area here, it called for the construction of dock walls and the reclamation of Ashbridge's Bay for a very mixed-use development. The original design called for residential development along the south shore. In fact, Lakeshore Boulevard was supposed to cross the West Channel, get across Toronto Island, and then come across the East Gap and run along roughly where Unwin Avenue is right now. It would then con continue out to Scarborough. North of that would be mixed industrial and commercial development with large warehouses as well as heavy industry. To put this plan in place, they started in 1914, and by 1917 they were constructing the dock walls that are now in place along the western edge of the portlands. These dock walls consist of timber cribbing filled with stone, and on top of that are concrete dock walls that are tied back into the land through anchor rods and anchor piles go back probably a good 20 to 25 feet. So all of that soil that was being reclaimed from the inner harbor being pumped into Ashbridge's Bay through uh, hydraulic suction dredges is being held in place there by these anchor piles that are some 25 feet in the land. You talk about some of the soil conditions in there. That's it. So the, uh, the areas that are going to not um, in the past been used so intensively for industrial purposes as the northern area here. Well, this area has um, we'll pick up less of the feedback. Right, right. There's some more recent information from studies of this area. And uh, in the past, as you can see from this 1965 uh, aerial photograph, uh, there was actually a soil refinery on this land. All, all of these tanks uh, associated with that operation it used to be more tanks. Uh, uh, the tanks on this side have been removed. Uh, I believe these are the uh, uh, feedstock tanks, and uh, they actually produce gasoline and diesel on the site. So uh, the investigations uh, revealed, as we expected, that there's uh, uh, petroleum hydrocarbon contamination in the subsurface. Um, the uh, way that the petroleum hydrocarbons used in the subsurface is 
uh, such that there's a layer of soil uh, where it's between what is going to be this thing, but actually it's not too impacted. Uh, what happens in general is that the spill moves to low point, infiltrates the ground at low point. Uh, when the liquid meets the groundwater table, being less dense than water, uh, they tend to landward, so eventually evolve. Um, in addition to that, there's risk management measures that can be taken to uh, separate people and animals from the hydrocarbon. And there's uh, uh, very simple uh, treatment mechanisms that can be used. So, I think my time's about up. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How's that? Can everyone hear me? Closer. Even closer, yeah. Closer? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you very much for coming. We uh, asked for better weather, but unfortunately, we don't control everything. Uh, my name is Frank Serafini. As Del said, I'm the Director of Development for Toronto Film Studios. And uh, we're the company that's uh, responsible for constructing Filmport, which is just across the Don Roadway here. And those machines you see in the distance to your east are actually uh, building part of phase one of the studio complex, a uh, state-of-the-art uh, large uh, purpose-built facility. We have quite an industry in the city, but the facilities that are purpose-built are smaller, and the other facilities are basically uh, revamped and uh, uh, reused uh, old industrial facilities. So with uh, several uh, people uh, applied to uh, put in a bid for the proposal to build the, the studios, and we were the successful ones, and so since then we've been working hard to develop the facility in this area. One of our main mandates was to develop a facility that was uh, uh, recognized as a global uh, media and television center and uh, promote the film industry in this city. Uh, the city. The facility itself is quite large if you were to uh, in phase one of the actual facility and phase one is going to represent about 40% of the actual built-out area. The film port is divided into, into uh, three main categories. Let me adjust myself here. Uh, shops, which are where sets are built and uh, things that are used in the film studio themselves are constructed. Phase one encompasses building E that you see here. Part of building I, this part here, and building H, which the shops, and building F on this uh, site plan here. Uh, I'm not going to bother going through the details of how many square feet of this office space uh, is contained within the complex. There's a handout that you've all been given that gives you that information, but there's one of the things I wanted to point out was uh, building F will be a 45,500 square foot stage when it's completed. It will be the largest stage in the world. It's over an acre of floor space, column three, and that is one of the main intents of, uh, that, that Tedco had in mind when they first developed it, was to, to try to build a facility that would be, draw the big blockbusters to, uh, to our city. And right now, it's in the process of being constructed. If you were to walk on to the east side of Salter Street, just south of Commissioner, the pad for that stage is already prepared and in the near future we'll be driving piles through all the peat and the and the, the marshes that used to be here, as our previous speaker said, to go down to bedrock because that's the only place we can go to get uh, our contain office buildings which will be used by various companies that don't have to be on the studio a lot, but proximity to the studio makes a lot of sense. They include uh, ent entertainment lawyers, production companies, etc. And then the area along the ship channel will have the same type of uses with, uh, that the public can, can, uh, can use, but that also can be used for filming. And so there's, it's a way for the public to actually mingle and get a real taste of what the film industry is all about. And some of the um, perspective drawings, which we unfortunately, it's, it's difficult to keep them still in this wind, but feel free to take a look at them and they basically give you an understanding of what kind of things we are envisioning along the, late, uh, along the ship channel and uh, what our main entrance would look like uh, when it's finally, of course, all the flood risk will be eliminated. And But because our facility is probably going to be constructed before that's all completed, what we've done is we've worked closely with all the groups that are involved, Toronto Regional Conservation Authority, 
uh, waterfront revitalization at Go the City to ensure that that uh, we're accommodating future plans. And our main buildings along the public corridor there are being designed by uh, a world famous architect, Will Alsop. And the idea behind those buildings is they're designed with the measurement of a green space in front of them. Park-like setting that's envisioned. So, from a visual and a physical point of view, there's going to be a link to the, to the future uh, feel of the whole area. We've got green roofs in some of our buildings, including one that's going to go right here during phase one. We're looking at the use of solar panels over these stage areas because we have big flat roofs and they're they're ideal for those things. We're looking at the economics of that right now. We've got bioswales that we've created within the facility, so the storm water that comes off of the roofs, uh, off of the parking lots, are treated before they are actually allowed to be released into the, uh, into the ship channel, but they're treated naturally with plants and, and, uh, and the like that are uh, ideal for uh, treating a ground, uh, uh, storm water runoff. And of course, our roof water is being funneled into this water feature there, which would be partly usable by the public, and it's going to be used to irrigate landscape areas from the buildings, and then the remainder will be will be put into the ship channel through a uh, separate piping system because it's relatively clean. And if you were to look to the east, you've got big piles of fill which were taken off the site and the, the wood is being drawn out of it so that it can be mulched and, and used for planting beds and the remaining soil will be used as topsoil. And we've also got probably what a hundred about 100,000 tons of concrete that we've crushed and we're using all the crushed concrete as a uh, a base for our parking lots and under. We've got the pumping station for that also runs through the river. And uh, there are also very tight bones in the bridge. So between rail and, and natural gas and water and sewer and everything else, and electricity, there's an awful lot of infrastructure that will probably have to be adjusted and jigged around with as part of this project. So uh, it's a great place to really get a handle on how much it is. when you look at a, at a city map from Cherry Street, which is just to the west of us here, right over to uh, where Wabloz is at uh, uh, Jarvis. Jarvis. Mm -hmm. uh, we've just completed at uh, the city a bylaw process uh, for the East Bayfront West area, which is from Parliament Street west to Jarvis. We got a bylaw enacted by City Council at its last session on the 27th of September. The notice was in the paper on Thursday advising the public of the passing of the bylaw, and we're now waiting for any appeals that we may get. That 
appeal process is being coupled with the initial plan, uh, secondary plan appeal process, and we are back at the Ontario Municipal Board at the end of November. Hopefully we will get some of that land released uh, in the approval process, and if so, you would be able to, uh, as a developer, um, start the process for approval of particular land and uh, start the process to actually develop the land. Uh, we are also working on design guidelines for those areas, and there is an ongoing public outreach. Uh, we have a website on the city's uh, webpage related to uh, the Toronto waterfront. So it's toronto.ca slash waterfront. And from there you can find staff reports on the West Donlin, East Bayfront. You will see these reports. You can look at the bylaw and you can uh, contact us and uh, try to involve yourself, if you wish, in the ongoing work. The next phase of work will take the planning for the East Bayfront East section, which is primarily the land between here and uh, basically those just beyond those along the water. Um, that would be a 17 meter wide uh, public walkway, uh, area for retail to spill out into that so that, that retail shops and restaurants and so on will have a face on the water. There will be green park areas um, at the opposite red paths at Sherbert Street and over here at the Parliament Slip. And um, then Queen's Key comes through the middle and there are east-west connectors as well on either side of Queen's Key. Um, that will be a mixed-use community with residential, some employment, and with retail. Okay. Um, so my name is Bill Dawson. I'm with the TDC. I'm, I'm project managing the um, uh, trans, waterfront trends and environmental assessments. Um, this is the, we're doing a, these studies very, very much similar to the way TRCA is doing the House of the Dawn. We're doing it on behalf of the, uh, TWRC. The Toronto Waterfront Revitalization Corporation, um, and in fact, we just by way of background, uh, there's been a lot of planning done. Angus has referred to the fact. I mean, we, we, we had both secondary plans and precinct plans in detail for the. We have a secondary plan for the whole area, including the port, and we have precinct plans and EA master plans for the East Bayfront area, which Angus showed you, and the West Dawn, the old Atari site uh, to the northwest here. Um, what, and, and, and that's the basis for our work. Um, those, um, those approvals, both the Waterfront Corporation and the City, were very clear about some of the principles and objectives of the area of, of redevelopment here. And certainly one of the, the very important ones was to make it um, excellent from a transportation, sustainability, and environmental point of view. And part of that meant to make it as non-auto-oriented as was reasonable. Some uh, uh, exclusive transit rights of way down on on major roadways on Queens Key, on Cherry, on and then Cherry both from King Street down to Commissioner Street and transit right of ways on Commissioner and Unwin and actually up Leslie connecting to the the, the east. That's what's in the secondary plan. Um, we've gone ahead for a, 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 a transit EAs. I think you've heard that there's a, a kind of a, individual EAs, so there's a two-step process. You, we prepare our terms of reference. We've prepared terms of reference for the whole area, for East Bayfront, West Dawn, and the Portlands, because from a transit point of view, it's all one. It's got to be a network. It's got to tie together. It's all got to fit together. You don't want to do one thing here that precludes you from doing good things elsewhere. So we've developed terms of reference based on a on, on the on the whole network. Uh, and we went, went through that process in the spring, and some of you may have come to our community meetings and, and helped us develop those terms of reference. Both, those terms of reference are, are with the Ministry of the Environment now. We expect to get approval of them in the next... Uh, we'll be presenting those in, a, in, in public meetings uh, in probably in January, perhaps in late November, but probably January at this point. Um, we're, we're optimistic that we'll work through alternative, planning alternatives and then design alternatives over 2007. I think 
hopefully the West Dawn area perhaps it will be a little bit a little bit simpler. We can we can address those things perhaps more quickly, um, and we should have some answers hopefully by the summer. East Bayfront a little more complex. There's a few more issues involved. Uh, things like the Red Path Rail Spur has to be accommodated in some way. Uh, access to Union Station for transit facilities is, is quite complicated. We have a streetcar loop there that's pretty inadequate at the moment. It certainly couldn't handle the expected demand for the future. So East Bayfront has a couple of other problems that will make it. Sure. That interface that you want? The, and, 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 as you may know, the city is uh, contemplating an Expo 2015 bid. City Council is certainly on side and has said a number of times they would like to do it. Uh, the, it, it requires a fairly substantial commitment of funding from the province and the federal government. We're going to find out more about that. There's a deadline coming up for essentially, I think, somewhere in November, end of November, for a funding commitment from senior levels of government. If, if that occurs and we're, we, the city of Toronto, are making a bid, there's going to have to be some um, fairly quick planning to determine how best to actually integrate current plans, notably for the whole port area, which is this is the site plant proposed for the expo bid. You know, and, and as part of that, there's some fairly significant line operating from Union Station through here in some way and unloading passengers to get to the port for the expo site. Um, the expo is only going to be in operation for about six months, uh, so the question really remains, you know, how much money do you put into it as a permanent venture and what do you do with it afterwards? I think we, we you know, we've visited Montreal, you, they still, they built some fairly substantial facilities for their expo bid that truly are essentially sitting there empty now. They've become kind of white elephants. What, what the heck do you do with them afterwards? That's some of the issues we're going to have to face, particularly about this transit line, which won't necessarily be very useful after the end of the expo. With, uh, one of the consulting firms working for the Waterfront Revitalization Corporation, so I look after transportation issues. So obviously road issues are really what we're talking about here, and there's a lot of things to resolve. We're, we're starting from the city's secondary plan, which has some visions for this idea, and there are also some of the ideas related to what's happening with the Gardner and Lakeshore, and obviously we're trying to uh, integrate those plans with what's happening with Don Mouth Revitalization. So all of those things are kind of moving along piece by piece and hopefully coming together into a vision that's really going to integrate this area uh, much better into the city's transportation network and make it more of an urban network rather than kind of the, the no man's land of just road connections through here that it is right now. So one of the big pieces is to support what Bill was talking about in terms of bringing transit along Queen's Quay. Uh, there's an RF, a request for proposal that's going to be out for an EA for extending Queen's Quay to the east. Right now, it basically stops. The fact that Cherry and Lakeshore really kind of smushed together just over here into one road that doesn't really function very well. We'd like to have Cherry be more of a normal city connection north-south, up into the city and down into the Portlands, and have Lakeshore, instead of overlapping it, have it just intersect at more of a normal intersection. So realign Lakeshore and hopefully try to create some better either developable land or some land that can be part of the, re the, uh, the naturalization area as well. So all of those things are in play in terms of where Lakeshore might be, uh, how Cherry might go north-south, and then of course overhead we've got the gardener. So if the gardener comes down in this area, that's a real opportunity to make this more of kind of a regular urban area, and that would give a lot more scope for moving Lakeshore. One of the ideas uh, on the table is to move Lakeshore from where it is down here, just that further against the rail corridor here. So that's one alternative. And that would give a better intersection with Cherry, and then you'd have a much nicer piece of land here that could either be part of the naturalization area or a combination of naturalization and development area up on this side of things and keep Lakeshore a little further south. So, you know, it could, Lakeshore could be in either position up further north or down here further south. But either way, that gives some more scope if the gardener comes down to create just a more urban area that's less, less of a highway route area and create more of a, a, a regular street network. Yes? Can you talk about transit coming along uh, Queen's Key? Right. Is that railway? The rail? That's a, that would be Why is there this interest in a rail when you have a road? 
fast pace to it. evaluations, if you did not put Lakeshore underneath the garden, what would you do? What would what? If you didn't put Lakeshore underneath this yeah. freeway, what would you do? I think I think there still is a little bit of play to move it. To get, to slight, get better geometry. Yeah, a slight, a slight degree, but certainly not to the same amount. What are the implications of that then for the transit ways? And oh, I, I don't think that would really have much of an impact on the transit, because the transit really is going to be on Queen's Key and Cherry. Okay. So as long as we can get the transit vehicle through, that's going to... Sure. Uh, the network relative to the river, you know. Um, one uncertainty still is about how wide the bridge on Cherry Street needs to be, and that's really going to impact where Queen's T comes in and how we how we weave Lakeshore through. So those are questions that are still in play right so now. If, if you're on Brit on stilt, the costs go up significantly than if you have a land. They would certainly, you know. Um, and those options are still things to be worked out through the EA. That, that's about all I wanted to say. I do have some handouts. I think there were copies on the table back there. The wildlife piece or, or the naturalization piece, you know, in, in, in among these conversations about transit, you know, um, with all this other stuff that's going on, this is still is a, a corridor and, uh, you know, immediately adjacent to these areas, there are a number of very significant uh, wildlife or natural spaces. Um, I do oversee the uh, biological management of Tommy Thompson Park, uh, which for those that don't know, um, is officially uh, um, an ESA, an environmentally significant area. Um, it was also designated an IBA, an important bird area, and that's a global designation. Um, uh, uh, bird Life International, which is a, a global organization, has designated this spot. It's one of 55 in, in uh, Canada. Um, and it is recognized global for its contribution to bird life. Um, one of the major reasons are the colonial waterbird populations, the, uh, the ring-billed gulls, the, the double-crested cormorants, the black-crowned night herons, um, and, you know, all that under the shadow of the CN Tower. It's a pretty significant thing, um, and we've actually done a lot of uh, search around to, to try to find um, something as signi biologically significant so close to an urban, urban center, and there, there's not much, um, you know, often compared to Stanley Park on, on, the, on the West Coast. Um, but it, it, it's a very unique, uh, which the average person doesn't, you know, necessarily, a, it's not a very common sparrow, but it's a very significant bird that's moving through. It's that in amongst this. Um, there's some, um, we're, we, we are running a, a bird banding lab down at, down at the site. Um, I encourage anybody to, uh, to, to show up uh, on the weekends. Um, it runs from uh, sunrise, not that uh, people are probably going to show up there at sunrise, but it goes till about noon. Um, you can go at any time and see what's going on. Um, but it's a very uh, unique project that's going on there. Um, 
We have a, an Oak Ridge Parade, Tommy Thompson Park Migratory Bird Project, and we've been documenting bird movement that moved down the Don River and then um, used the Tommy Thompson Park and the Spit, as well as the Toronto Islands as these staging areas of the Fort Park right now, and also ones that were uh, originally radio collared um, at the Dansby Air Force Base. And interestingly enough, we had a coyote that was originally collared and released at the Downsview Air Force Base. Um, somehow it found its way down through the corridors, um, was picked up a couple times um, around the Riverdale Farm area, and then ended up at Tommy Thompson Park. Well, it spent the season here at Tommy Thompson Park, found a mate. Um, we've had coyotes at the park for about the, uh, the last 11 years. Um, found a mate. Um, unfortunately, the mate was, uh, was killed by a, a car um, on uh, Commissioner Street. Um, and then it hung around for a while, and then it just disappeared. We, we, for months, we weren't able to pick it up on, uh, on, uh, with the tracking gear. Um, and then uh, two years ago, we actually got a call from the, uh, the, Mid or the, the Midhurst uh, District MNR that had a hunter that had turned in a, a, a coyote with a, a radio collar on it that was uh, with our, our um, um, address on it. This coyote had made its way from here all the way to Georgian Bay um, and uh, was unfortunately shot uh, going across the ice up onto an island. Um, so, you know, you look at these places, at times they're, they're sort of written off as, as uh, um, you know, biological areas, but, you know, coyotes aren't necessarily the, the best animal to, to, to uh, base corridors or, or, or transportation linkages on, because they are a highly mobile species. But, again, we, we we're exchanging genetic material, or we're moving, you know, genes and, and, and animals from urban areas like this that are exchanging with, uh, with areas further in Portland and the Don, the Don Corridor. They all function together, you know, it's, 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 uh, when you look at it from, a, from a, an aerial map perspective, it, it's the hourglass. You've got the big wide berth of the park, which is conjunction with the island, then you have this narrow band of, of, you know, cityscape, and then you get up to the, the higher Don uh, Valley area where, you know, deer and a whole variety of things are more common. Um, but we are, we are very lucky, lucky right now. We are just embarking upon uh, our master plan build-out at Tommy Thompson Park. Um, we're just starting an $8 million um, build-out. Uh, the money has come from uh, TWRC, and there's a variety of, of projects and activities that are currently underway. We'll put in there strategic wildlife gates um, to allow free movement of wildlife through. Um, but the, uh, this uh, current project that we're embarking upon, this uh, $8 million project, is $8 million of roughly, uh, probably to date, about a $30 million project. Um, and there's a number of, uh, of exciting uh, um, um, activities and things that are going on. I know uh, we did have a public forum uh, um, late. No, early, um, early this spring, uh, it was in March, and I know a few of the faces here that, that were at that. Um, but there's a number of very exciting um, activities um, that, that are going on, everything from the restoration of uh, colonial water bird nesting habitat, creating uh, denning structures and, and uh, butterfly meadows and, and a variety of things.